Hi everyone, I'm Victoria Tilly. I'm the Farm Energy Educator at the National Center for Appropriate Technology, known as NCAT. And I'm here today with Dave Scott. He's a livestock specialist at NCAT and the co-owner of Montana Highland Lamb. And today we're going to talk a little bit about lambing jug tips. Thank you, Victoria. First of all, a little bit about our system in the lambing barn. The uh, sheep drop their lambs here during the night or outside in a outside lambing pen. And then we bring the ewe and the lambs into this barn here and into the jugs. And the jugs are four foot by five foot little pen and the, uh, the mom and the, and the lambs mother up there so there's a nice tight bond between uh, mothers and lambs. Then after two days in the jugs, they go over to the other side of the barn there and we mix together three ewes and their lambs in a single pen that's eight by eight. And they're in that pen for, for two days and this puts more pressure on the <coughs> and the lambs to, to always keep track of their moms. And then after two days in those little mix pens, we bring them further yet down the barn and we put 12 ewes together with their lambs, and that's kind of high school. Uh, so the lambs have to keep track of their moms when there's 11 other moms in the pen with them, and they're in there for two days, and we watch them through this whole series of pens. We go through each and look at each lamb twice a day and make sure they're prospering, and if not, then we have to figure out why. And we want to talk a little bit today about what to look for in determining if a lamb is doing fine and if her mother's doing fine. And we're going to use an example today in the jugs. So Dave, what are the first things that you look for whenever you first put a U in the lamb? What we do is, is when, we're, when we take a, a lamb and her mother, or lambs and their, her mother, their mothers out of the drop pen or when, where she just lambed is the first thing I look for it, um, is the udder of the ewe. And I want to make sure I keep in mind that she has teats that are sized correctly for the lamb to suck on her. If they're abnormally fat, then I make a mental note and, and remember that I'm going to have to come back to that ewe and make sure that that lamb is able, or those lambs are able to, to nurse off the ewe. So what would a sick or cold lamb look like, Dave? Actually, this lamb, when I got up this morning, uh, it was like this. Its head was out like that, and we, we just call that the turkey pose, because it looks like a turkey. And, and when they're looking like this, they're usually really cold. And so you can test for how cold by putting your hand, your finger in their mouth. And if it's, if it's really cold, you can tell. And when it's that cold, what we do is we put them uh, in the oven, in the house. And we, we just turn the oven to 300 degrees. And once it gets to 300 degrees, we, we open the door and let enough of the heat out so it's about 100 to 110, 115 degrees in there. Then we put the, the little lamb in a pan and close the door and we wait. And usually after about 20 or 30 minutes, we hear a bath. Just like that. <laughs> so then we know that, that that little lamb is warmed up. Um, if they're really, really cold and basically lifeless, then that won't work. You have to take them into a hot sink, or a sink with hot water, about 120 degrees. And you just hold them, suspend them in the water with their head out like that and hold them there for about 20 degrees. And, and when they're that cold, they're not saying a thing. They're not even moving. So it's, uh, it's kind of a desperate situation. But you know that they've, they're coming around when they batch, just like that. <laughs> so those are two tricks that you can use to revive uh, cold lambs, and, and it really works. Any other things you look for in this newborn stage in the lambs? Yeah, the, the thing we look for is their eyes. When they're born, uh, sometimes their, their lower eyelid can be curved into the eyeball. And so that's called entropion. And you can just barely, 
See, this one has nice eyes. Um, but I mean, trochlear eye is the low, the lower eyelid will be curved like this in, and it, if you don't do anything about it, it will scar the cornea of the eye and the lamb will go blind. So all you have to do is you take the lamb and you pull the eyelid down just like that, and then another person puts some eye drops in it. And the eye drops we use is called Animas. It's a veterinary product. And then you let it go back like that. And you do that about twice a day for three or four days. And usually it heals. Um, if it doesn't heal, then you can do some more uh, little tricks. And veterinarians usually sew it back down so it can't, it can't fold under. But we found that all you have, to, if you're just diligent about popping it out and putting some eye drops in there, after, at least after a week, they'll heal. So besides some obvious signs of hunger, how do you sort of immediately know that the lamb might be getting enough to eat? Like, what's a good indication? Yeah, the lamb will tell you. When it's sucking, see, here's the udder right here of the mom, and it's sucking. This little tail was going wig, 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 really fast. And so that's how you, that's how they're happy. And so they're, they're just really happy to ni have nice warm milk and they show it by their tail. Um, the other thing that we didn't talk about, or we did, but didn't show it very well, is when you look at a lamb to see if they're full or not, you have to, you have to make them stand naturally or else. Or else, if you have them stretched out too much, they'll look skinny. Or if they're humped up like this, they'll look fat. So you have to let them just kind of st stand naturally. And then you look straight down here. And see, this one still doesn't have enough milk in it. So um, we have to watch it. And we may have to hook it up a couple times during the day. And generally what happens is uh, a ewe, especially a ewe lamb that lambs for the first time, they don't get all their milk all at once, and so um, we may have to supplement this, this little lamb, you know, with about uh, four or five ounces of milk uh, for two or three times a day until its mother has milk. And usually after a couple days, she gets more and more milk, and then you can tell that the lamb's getting a fuller and fuller belly, and then, then you can let her go herself. That's another thing. You see how this lamb just shook? That's a good sign. You want them nice. to shake. And there's their tail going. <laughs> shake it, yes. Yeah. When, when a lamb is lying down and they get up after they've been sleeping, they'll always stretch if they're, everything's good in lambville. So they'll just always take a stretch immediately after they they get up, and this one wasn't sleeping, so he's not stretching. But, but that's how we always check if, if the lamb's in good shape is when they just voluntarily get up after they've been lying down, they'll always, almost always stretch. So that's a good sign. So in regards to the used day, what do you usually look for whenever they're in that lambing jug? The easiest way to tell if a ewe is sick or not is by telling, by looking as she is eating and drinking. This ewe was fed at about 6.30 this morning and we use pellets in the lambing jug because they're easier than, than using hay and it keeps the stalls cleaner. Mm -hmm. So you can see that she's already ate all of her pellets. She ate about four pounds of pellets this morning. It's all gone and we'll be feeding them at about five this afternoon, another four pounds. And so if they're healthy and everything's going good in their lives, they'll eat those pellets in a couple hours. So if you, if you notice that she's not eating and she's not drinking, then something's wrong. So Dave, if the ewe's not eating or drinking enough, what does that usually mean? It can usually mean two things. First one is she might have mastitis. And the second reason is she might have pneumonia. 90% of the time, it's one of those two reasons. And to check and see if a ewe has mastitis, you just feel her udder. And that udder should be nice and pliable. There's some ewes that have really fleshy udders, so you have to take that into account. This udder here is just a really nice, pliable udder. And there's 
you reach all the way up to the back side of the attachment there feel all the way around and if there's any hardness or or if the udder is hot that means that particular half is, has mastitis and the udder is is composed of two halves in a sheep and they're totally independent of each other and so she can have mastitis on one half and still have good milk and a good tissue on the other half. So if she's got mastitis on one half, she's only going to be able to raise one lamb. So, and usually if, usually if they have mastitis, they'll be running a temperature of about 103, 104 degrees. So it's always good to have a thermometer with you so you can take their rectal, temp rectal temperature and that can tell you a lot. So two of the biggest tools that a shepherd can have in the lambing jugs is a stethoscope and, and a thermometer. And a sheep uh, a ewes normal temperature is 102.5. So she's running a temperature about four degrees more than, than humans do. And if it's elevated, either from mastitis or from pneumonia, it's going to be about 103 and a half on up to 106. If it gets up to 106, she's going to be one sick you. So we'll see if this mom will let us take her temperature. A lot of times you can have somebody help you. And it has to be in the rectum for about one minute. Otherwise, you won't get a correct reading. Okay, it's been about a minute, and we'll take her out. And she's 102.5. Nice. So... If she was if she was 103, I would start to be suspicious that something's going on. There's some kind of infection in her, and I would start looking at the two possibilities: one being mastitis, which we've already talked about, and the second one being pneumonia. And pneumonia is quite common in sheep, especially when you have days that are warm and uh, nights that are cold or if you have days and nights that are just drizzly cold all the time so what you do um, anybody can learn how to how to use the stethoscope uh, I learned from my veterinarian um, and it was worth the 20 or 30 dollars for the the farm call for him to just teach me how to use the stethoscope and then after that it's just practice you can also go online and google um, pneumonia sounding lungs and the, there'll be an audio online that will that will tell you but basically what they sound like is like that they're really raspy makes sense yeah and a, a nice healthy lung sounds like you're sipping through a straw like like that so what you do is there's three places on a you you want to listen to there's one really deep spot right here about right there on the U and then right here and then right here now if this U is about 11 years old that she's got a pretty good set of lungs still they're just a little bit noisy but not too bad yeah you're, you're doing good yeah um, if you have a chronic a chronic U she's kind of probably going to run about 103 degrees all the time on the temperature and her lungs are going to be just like that all the time so you have to kind of distinguish between a lung sound that is acute pneumonia that is more like and a chronic pneumonia sound like like that probably you're not going to be able to cure a chronic pneumonia so but you can oftentimes cure a, an acute pneumonia if you get to them soon enough, like within a few days after they came down with it. And generally what we use is penicillin. Um, there are not too many drugs that are labeled for sheep, and, but penicillin is one of them, and we try to, to use as little antibiotics as we can. And in that way, the sheep in our flock don't get resistant to penicillin. So... We don't just give, if a sheep looks like she's just not eating or not drinking very well, we just don't automatically go get the syringe and give her a shot. We check her rectal temperature and her pneumonia to see if she's really sick. Because mm. sometimes they just don't eat just because of 
you know, they're having a bad day or something, you know. So mm. it's nice to know if they're really sick before you give them any antibiotics. So, Dave, how do you usually treat uh, you with mastitis? Mastitis we usually uh, treat with penicillin also. Mastitis in sheep is a hard one to cure, though. Um, a lot of times, if you can just keep the sheep alive, you're doing fine because they can die from mastitis. It's called blue bag. And uh, I'd say a third of the time, despite the antibiotics, the, the you might die on you. But mm -hmm. what you can use is we give them penicillin, sub-Q, and then we can also give them uh, an, in an intramammary infusion uh, with a uh, antibiotic that you can get at your feed store or your veterinarian that's for dairy cows. And so you infuse that antibiotic up into the udder and uh, a lot of times it takes care of it. However, um, there's a really good product called Udder Mint Out and it's peppermint oil. And you can use that, that ointment, the Udder Mint, and just spread it all over her udder, the whole udder, the whole udder half that's that's of concern. And what that does is it takes inflammation out of the udder. And once you get inflammation out of the picture, then that udder can heal. So we try to keep udder mint on hand all the time and it really helps a lot. The other thing with pneumonia cases, if you have a lot of cases in your flock and it's kind of endemic, um, one thing you can do is vaccinate every year, every you, every year with an intranasal vaccine. It's called um, Nasalgen. It's been around for probably 40 years now, but it's still really good. And um, if I had to vaccinate sheep for anything with any IBRPA3 or anything that leads to pneumonia, I would use Nasalgen. Uh, it's a really good vaccine. And it's, it's um, just, you just shoot about a cc down each nostril and they're protected, you know, for a year. So it's a really good uh, vaccination to use against pneumonia. This is how you want your lambs and your moms to be. Right together all the time. And you can notice that the mom is looking at and paying attention to her babies and the babies are right by the mom. That tells you there's a bond there that's strong. If, a lamb, if one of those lambs was out in the corner there, not paying attention to its mom at all, then you, it would raise some questions in your mind. So Dave, do you continue to watch lambs and ewes that you've had trouble with in the lambing jugs after they leave those? Do you kind of keep watch after them? Yes, we do. Um, it's really important that, because they could go south on you again. Um, even like if the ewe, uh, was not taking care of her lambs in the jugs and you left her in there another day or two and she looked like she was doing okay, she could decide in a few days later that she doesn't want those lambs again. So mm. you have to keep monitoring in the, in the little jugs and we're standing here in the big jugs. And so they, after about seven days and you've gotten rid of hopefully all the problems and, and corrected them, then usually when they can go outside and and usually those problems are taken care of. So you have to keep watching them. Um, as I said earlier, we try to check every lamb twice a day in this white barn here, the lambing barn, so that we know everything's good, in good shape. Gotcha. Well, thank you so much, Dave. It was a pleasure talking to you today about Montana Highland lambs and the lambing jugs. And um, yeah, this is Dave Scott, everybody, and I'm Victoria Tilly. You can reach Dave at daves at ncat.org. Or you can reach me at my phone at 406-533-6642. I'd love to talk to you. Any questions that you have.